Hello and welcome to Devil's Advocate. The Armed Forces Tribunal has ruled that the Court of Inquiry conducted against the former Military Secretary, Lieutenant General Avdesh Prakash, was unfair. But General Prakash tells me that that's not the only instance of unfairness that he's faced. Today, for the first time, after maintaining silence for three months, he's prepared to speak publicly about the Sukhna land scam and about how he's been treated. Lieutenant General Prakash, let's start with the Court of Inquiry conducted by the Eastern Command of the Indian Army last year. You have several reasons for being unhappy with it. To begin with, you believe its composition was not appropriate for an officer of your rank. Why do you say that? There's a provision in the Defence Service Regulation which provides that when military reputation in the character of an officer or for that matter anybody is a material issue, <clears throat> then the presiding officer of the inquiry has to be senior wherever possible and all the members at least of the same rank. But in the instant case, the presiding officer, though of the same rank, was junior in service. But what most importantly was that both the members were major generals, junior in rank and obviously junior in service. Now you're referring to Army Regulation 518. Is this breach of the regulation merely procedural or is it substantive? I would say it's an important uh, regulation and uh, that's why it's there. A second reason why you have complaints about the Court of Inquiry is that it breached Army Rule 180 which says that if evidence is going to be given against an officer which could affect his reputation, the officer must be present. That didn't happen in your case. But the Armed Forces Tribunal on your appeal has reopened the case, it's given you access to the deposition of six witnesses as well as permission to cross-examine them. Is that in your eyes partial relief or is it substantial and full relief? I would say that the opportunity given to me now of cross-examining these witnesses would possibly put things in correct perspective because uh, all these officers or the witnesses which came, came in isolation and in my absence. So I would, uh, some more issues will come to light and put things in correct perspective. So this is partial relief, but it's given you an opportunity to correct things. I believe so. One reason why it's important for you to correct things is because you believe one of the witnesses who deposed when you weren't present has allegedly lied to the court of inquiry. Karan, I'd not like to name this officer. And I also like to say that I have no bias against him, but this gentleman alleged that he was a victim of my undoings as MS. But the fact of the case was that this gentleman had asked for a posting to a non-family station because he wanted to retain accommodation in Delhi for treatment of his family members. So it is important that such allegations which are ill-founded are made in presence of the officer or say in this case me so that the army, in case the army rule was applied correctly, this probably wouldn't have happened. So what happened was that this person claimed that you had been unfair and in fact the truth is that he asked for a particular posting and you agreed to abide by his request. Yes, we did that. So again, this example shows that the failure to apply army rule 180 in your case is not just a theoretical disadvantage, you have actually been harmed in fact. I have, you know, this is one example. There are one more examples also, but I think this will suffice to say that this is one example which proves what I've just said. Is it then your position that you would have preferred the Court of Inquiry to be scrapped altogether, a new inquiry set up with a new presiding officer and new members? Would that have been your preference? Could be, but anyway, a decision has been taken by the Honourable Tribunal. And you're so prepared to accept that decision? I accept that. But you would have preferred a new inquiry? Yeah. Let's come to your second issue of concern. You believe that the army chief did not apply his mind fully to your reply to the show cause notice he sent you for th administrative action. Why do you believe that? As per my knowledge, the court of inquiry was received from Headquarter Eastern Command around 22nd or 23rd of December. And the show cause notice was given to me on 11th of January. It means about three weeks of time was taken. I gave my reply on 22nd of January. Then on 29th, I was given, to, given a letter which says that administrative action 
is cancelled and I have disciplinary reaction is to be initiated against me. Now just see the contrast. You have just in those last six days also there were three working days. You have taken three days to change the decision from administrative action to disciplinary action, whereas almost three weeks for the court of inquiry to be examined. So to clarify what you're saying is that whereas the army chief took three weeks to respond to the findings of the court of inquiry, he in effect has just taken three working days to respond to your show cause notice. And that contrast leads you to believe that he hasn't applied his mind fully to your reply to the show cause notice. That's right. A second area or a third area of concern that you have is that you dispute what the army chief said on this program two weeks ago when he said that he had changed from administrative to disciplinary action after considering your reply. Why do you dispute that? Now let me tell you one thing that the letter which I got on 29th of January, the first para says that Shoko's notice issued to me by the army on 11th January is cancelled and there is no mention of my reply at all. So let me clarify, if the show cause notice against you is cancelled, as the army chief's letter of the 29th of January says, then that means your reply to the show cause notice is also cancelled and hasn't been considered. Is that what you're saying? That's right. That's right. Because there is no mention of the reply at all. And secondly, you're saying that that letter of January 29th doesn't in any shape or form refer to your reply. That's right. That's right. So this leads you to the conclusion that when the army chief said on this program two weeks ago that he had considered your reply before ordering disciplinary action, he's not telling the full truth. I won't comment this for you to infer now. <laughs> but that is the clear inference, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Finally, and perhaps most importantly of all, you believe that when the army chief switched from administrative action to disciplinary action, he was in flagrant violation of a well-established and long-practiced military policy dating back to 1993. What proof do you have of this? I'll show you a letter, which is here with me. And uh, this letter has been issued by the AG's branch, Army Headquarters. AG's branch is Adjutant General's Adjutant branch. General's branch in the Army Headquarters, which deals with the discipline and vigilance also. It says, once the competent authority, after having applied his mind to full facts of the case, decides to initiate administrative action and such action has commenced, at this stage to revert to disciplinary action is not only unjustified but also legally untenable, unsustainable. The last para of this letter says, this letter is addressed to the command headquarters. It says that you are therefore requested to bring the contents of this letter to the notice of all concerned for compliance. So that letter which you are quoting to me, A establishes army policy that once you have started administrative action and it has commenced, you cannot arbitrarily switch to disciplinary action. And secondly, everyone in the army is required to comply with this. That's right. On the 29th of January, when you received a letter saying that the army was going to take disciplinary action against you, that also happened to be your last day in service before you retired. Did you at that point before you retired point out to the authorities that this was a breach of established army policy dating back to 1993? The letter was handed over to me on 29th around 11 in the morning. And 29th is the day when you have the beating of the retreat and the, all the office is closed by about 1 o'clock. And that's the time I was also being bid farewell from the MS branch. And that's the time I got this shock, that letter, that administrative action has been converted into disciplinary action. So I really had no time to uh, complain or to uh, tell anyone. Do you think that the timing of the delivery of this letter was deliberate so that you wouldn't have time to protest? That they'd actually done it so cleverly to deny you the right to protest? Could be, but I think uh, I'm not in a position to answer that uh, question because the people who, somebody else must answer this, not me. Let's take a break at that point, General Prakash. I want to come back and in part two of this exclusive interview, I want to talk to you about what the press called the Sukhna land scam. 
and then about the indictments that you face yourself. That's in a moment's time. See you after the break. Welcome back to Devil's Advocate and an exclusive interview with the former military secretary, Lieutenant General Avesh Prakash, speaking for the first time on the Sukhna land scam and the indictments he faces. General Prakash, at the heart of what the press calls the Sukhna land scam is a proposal to build a school on roughly some 71 acres of land that belonged to the Chumta T estate outside the Sukhna military station. The charge against you is that you contrived with the developers to circumvent or overcome the army's objections to this school. But you tell me that the army actually doesn't have the power or the authority to object. On what grounds did you say that? As you mentioned yourself, that land does not belong to the army, that's number one. Number two, a military station is different from a cantonment. In a military station, the local military authorities have no jurisdiction whatsoever on the land adjacent to their area. And therefore I say that they have no right on this issue of no objection certificate or any, you know, land on that land. Next point I also want to bring to your notice, I mean, uh, we all of us know, you see in Delhi cantonment, there are schools there. Within the cantonment, here we are talking of a school outside. A military station. So if schools can exist inside a cantonment, there's no reason why they can't exist outside a military station. That's what I'm saying. In which case, why did the developer seek a no objection certificate from the corps commander at Sukhna? I can just presume, I suppose, for maybe when they bring up and shoot like that, they want to have neighborly relations with the uh, military authorities there. That's all I can say. But isn't it also the case that when the developers first approached the corps commander at Sukhna, he refused? Later on, he changed his mind. You know, I'd like to bring to your notice that uh, in the initial instance, the commercial lease which was there, that was for creating malls and resorts there, which could have been a security-related issue. But here, the instance had been changed for an educational institute. And I suppose that's the reason why co commander must have changed his uh, decision. So he changed his decision because the developers had changed what they wanted to build. I suppose, yes. So on the basis of what you just told me, is the use of the term scam inappropriate or even misleading? Absolutely, because no, the land does not belong to army. No money has exchanged hands. The land remains with the original owners. So where is the scam? I just don't understand that. Let's now come to your personal relationship with the developer, a certain Mr. Dilip Agarwal. It's said that you know him well, that he's a close personal friend. Would you accept that? Yes, I have. In fact, that's the first line of my statement in the inquiry that uh, I have said it up front that I know him. Now, the indictment against you, the first of the indictments is that in the company of Mr. Dilip Agarwal, you met with Maharaja Gad Singh of Jodhpur and you discussed the school project. Can you accept that? Let me tell you, Karan, that. Uh, I was in Jodhpur, Mr. Dilip Agarwal had arranged a meeting with Maharaja and he asked me if I would like to accompany and I thought possibly a dignitary of his status, I said let me go. It was more of a courtesy call. And at that point of time, even Dilip Agarwal had not made any mention to me in any details about this project and I just accompanied him. You make it sound like an innocent meeting. But was it, in fact, not improper for you to meet Maharaja Gad Singh in the company of the developer? Let me also make it clear that just one meeting does not give you franchise. There's, I'm sure, I'm not even aware today, there must have been more uh, procedures before you get a franchise. In the hindsight, one can presume that it was uh, not correct. But I thought it was a, I mean, at that point of time, I thought it was a harmless uh, thing to do. The second indictment against you is that in the company of the developer, Mr. Dilip Agarwal, you visited the land at Sukhna where the proposed school is to be built. Again, I put it to you, was that not improper for you to do? You know, I was on a visit to Sukhna. I had some spare time in the evening. The gentleman approached me and I drove around that area for just about five to ten minutes. 
Just five, ten minutes? Yes, that's right. So you're saying that the time duration was so short, the visit was innocent? I would say, I mean, no proposals or any other such things could have been discussed in those five to ten minutes. But on both of these issues, meeting Maharaja Gat Singh in the company of the developer, visiting the land in the company of the developer, would you concede that it looks improper, even if it wasn't improper, in fact, it looks improper, it looks wrong? Uh, that's what I have uh, said, that uh, at that point of time, and in hindsight, you can perceive those things. But uh, I thought it was, they were really totally harmless and there were no, nothing, you know, which I really wanted to, you know. With hindsight, it yeah. looks worse than it did at that time. Exactly, exactly. The final indictment yeah. is that you recommended to the core commander at Sukhna that he should give permission for this school and that you then proceeded to also put pressure on him to do so. You know, I had made a mention to him about this. He had invited me for dinner. Let me uh, give you an example. Like I'm, I was a military secretary. I would get quite a few recommendations from my colleagues, from senior officers and even retired senior officers and they would be passed on to the appropriate officer who would examine those, analyze and put up for directions of the competent authority at whatever level. Now if a decision is taken by that competent authority, do you believe that the person who recommended the case is to be blamed? In other words, you are saying when you recommended this case to the Sukhna Corps commander, you were doing what you have done frequently previously as military secretary. You treated this just like any other thing you would treat as military secretary. I would say that and in any case, in his case, in case of uh, the co-commander, you know, he's a lieutenant general. I'm a lieutenant general. Co-commander is a, also a very important person. There are 13 of them in the Indian Army. I have, I, he does not uh, come under, I mean, I have no direct jurisdiction on him. So therefore, for me to this theory of putting pressure or influencing him, I think appears fast, fast, fast. In other words, you're concerned. saying the corps commander is of the same rank as you, yes. and he's one of 13, he's therefore important, and you as military secretary cannot put pressure on him. That's right. You're absolutely sure that that is what the truth is? Of course, is. of course. Listening to your answers on the three indictments, I want to put this question to you. If the army chief had stood by his original decision of administrative action and not changed to disciplinary action, would you have accepted some form of censure as perhaps an appropriate punishment? I would say now it's a hypothetical question. I really, what do I answer? Because uh, in the show cause notice, I deny those allegations. Many people say that at the bottom of this whole sorry affair is a rivalry or a bitterness between Lieutenant General V.K. Singh, the present Army Commander, Eastern Command, who's going to be the next Army Chief and yourself. Colonel, let me tell you that this is uh, absolutely wrong. We have been colleagues, uh, young officers. We have had postings together. And there's no question of any rivalry or any... Uh, let me also tell you that during my tenure as MS, he is one gentleman who never recommended any case to me. And I'm very clear on that. So there was never an instance when he asked you for something which you refused, which could have annoyed him? There was never an instance of your rebuffing him? No, no, no way. And I think it is somebody's, you know, that imagination of some fertile mind which uh, says so. Finally, you haven't spoken to the press up till now. Why have you not told them your full story? I would say, Karan, that uh, when I was in army, <clears throat> I was bound by the code of conduct. And as far as after I retired, my case was sub with the Armed Forces Tribunal and therefore I decided not to speak to anyone. Why are you today speaking to me? How do I answer you? I would say that uh, I thought that I must, somebody, through somebody, I must tell people at large that uh, whatever answers I have given to you, I must give my side of the story and I think I must put myself and whatever I have, I must put it across to those people for my sake and for the, my own family 
that uh, and it's for people to decide after this interview as to what is correct and what is wrong in other words you want to clear your name you don't want to be thought of as a tainted general exactly i mean you, media said tainted dagi in hindi and you know, so i must clear that so that's the reason i have come to you today general prakash a pleasure speaking to you thank you thank you mr